Welcome back to the Sure Dog Radio Network Rewind. I'm Jack and Canarcio, and it's once again time for the Sunday sit down. So, Chris Weidman, this is what it's like to be fighting Anderson Silva. So, at this point, about two weeks out, does it feel like you thought it would feel? I guess. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know. I didn't really think about how it would feel two weeks before, but uh, I'm just focused and I'm feeling good and anxious to get in there. You know, I'm just excited to, uh, you know, go out there and shine and do what I, you know, I believe I can do. So I'm just uh, excited. You've been very active and busy, of course, in this period, probably busier than you've ever been at any point in your life. When a fighter gets to a main event position, particularly a title fight against the likes of an Anderson Silva or George St. Pierre, it's probably a much different media experience, probably a much different schedule, uh, pressure and things like that. Can you describe how that may have changed for you compared to your previous fights? Uh, yeah, I guess it's a little, definitely more. Um, but I, I mean, I was kind of aware of that coming and uh, prepared for it mentally. And it's fine. You know, I'm just trying to enjoy enjoy that. You know, it's just part of the journey of you know fighting. So it's just um, you know, 20 years from now, I'm sure there's not going to be people knocking on my door to interview me. Yeah. Hopefully there is, but you know, but I doubt doubtful. So well, I'm just enjoying I'm enjoying the media the media stuff too. I'm, I'm, I don't mind it. That's excellent. You seem to be prepared for the possibility that someone might not want to interview you in 20 years. Is that your thought that that's just the way MMA is? Yeah, it's just, I mean, you're like, how long am I going to have this as my career? You know, it's, I mean, hopefully, you know, I, I do want to be known as one of the greatest of all time. I do want to, you know, become champion, be a young champion and, and, and do a lot of, you know, proving, you know, and, and show the world what I think, you know, I can do. So, um, who knows, but probably not. Probably not, probably not people begging for my autograph. Sure. Um, what question have you gotten the most in the run-up to this fight? Um, in interviews? Yeah. Um, just, you know, what does it feel like you're going to be fighting against this over, I guess? You know, do you really understand, you know, how big this is, that type of thing? I think it's probably one of the biggest. Um, yeah, it's probably the biggest. Do you feel like that's a stupid question? <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I guess no stupid. No questions stupid. All questions are good. All questions are good. <laughs> <laughs> How has it been? Um, well, let me let, let me jump right to this because there's a great profile on you in this month's edition of Fight Magazine, really taking a look at how you you you're integrated with Ray Longo and Matt Serra and and just the kind of uh, unique culture there is in that particular gym and, and, the, and the kinship you guys share as Long Islanders and all of that. And one of the things that you had said um, is the quote, I would get Facebook messages like, Chris, please be careful. He's extremely dangerous. Literally, like I'm going to get killed. And I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? I'll punch you in the mouth and I'll punch him in the mouth and I'll punch yeah. everybody in the mouth. <laughs> that's I mean, the quote for me? That's you, man. That's you. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I that was when I, I remember I actually remember talking with that. Uh, yeah, I remember getting messages. I mean, I get messages like that all the time now. Um, now that I'm in the UFC, but my first experience with that was when I was fighting Uriah Hall pre UFC, and we were both undefeated. And anybody that knew him were, just thought he was like untouchable, and you know, and just thought he was like godlike. And especially if you went to one of the Tiger Showman schools, which is is like. 30 of them in New York, so there's a lot, a lot of people that go to the school, so there was a girl from uh, my high school that was a Tiger Showman, like Brown Belt or something, and she found out I'm fighting Uriah Hall, and so she messaged me saying, like, Chris, you know, I know you for a long time, but I just, you know, I saw you fighting Uriah Hall, you know, I just want to wish you luck, but please, please be careful, like, he's very dangerous, he's extremely dangerous, please just be careful in that, and I'm just like, are you freaking kidding me? He chose me shit. I had that reaction. What? Yeah. What are you supposed to? I don't care if it's Uriah Hall or Anderson Silva. What are you supposed to do with that? I mean, what do people? Ex how do people expect you to respond when they say that to you before a fight? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think I'm, I've been proving myself. So I'm not, there's not as much of that. You know, I mean, they're not going to be saying that when I'm fighting Uriah. Anderson is on another level as far as that. So people are saying it again. But I'm excited to prove uh, to show them a little bit of what I could do. I'm interested in the Uriah Hall example, if only because it happened all over again with that guy on the most recent season of The Ultimate Fighter. I'm sure you paid some attention to that. He had that amazing knockout and ran through everybody in, in The Ultimate yeah, Fighter House. 
he did it, and there was and it was back again um this this mystique around him that you remember from you know the ring of combat circuit and people who watch MMA in the tri-state area probably remember yeah. the first run of that what was that like to see him be like uh, uh made made mystified all over again and then and then knocked off that perch yeah i mean um i was happy for him you know he's an east coast guy i wanted you know, i wanted him to do good and i think uh, you know he went out there he deserved deserved that but you know, it's just uh, the, the people who were setting goals, really high goals for him early, and I think, uh, you know, and then obviously he lost, so now people are back down again. But, yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy to see that all happening again, but I was happy for him. Now, when you went through that with Uriah Hall, and, you know, the parallels are obvious, with the Anderson Silva dynamic, of course, those are two much different fighters we're talking about, but the dynamic is somewhat the same. Do you remember ever letting any of that fear creep in at all that others had for no. you? Not at all. I remember just kind of like that, like people, other people are like nervous for me, just got me like, I, like almost that had to like joke me, like, I don't, I don't kind of buy into the mystique of people, you know, I'm very clear-minded, you know, we're all human beings, you know, it's a person, person who's going to go out there and, uh, who really wants the most and put the most time in and work the hardest for the most of their ability is going to win, you know, and that's that, so. I'm not going to go out there and beat myself. If the guy's going to be better than me, he's going to be better than me. But uh, with Anderson Silva, I feel like I'm a better fighter. So I'm excited to go out there and show that. We've heard guys like George St. Pierre talk at great length about how beneficial, if you're a certain type of fighter or wired a certain way, that fear can be. Some guys apparently need that to push them that extra level to make them that much more aware and that much sharper in the cage, this fear of their opponent, fear of even fighting in the first place. Do you identify at all with that, or is, are you just on the total opposite end of that spectrum? Yeah, no, I understand uh, where they're coming from, like, they're scared in there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scared in there at all, no, I'm not, I'm more, uh, I just see the competition, I just want to win, I just want to, uh, I'm not, like, afraid to get hurt, I'm not even thinking about that, you know, it's like, uh, if you were playing football or basketball and you're thinking about getting hurt, you're going to get hurt. And that's going to be the same thing with MMA. So I just, I'm not even, I'm not thinking about that negative stuff. I'm just very focused on uh, going out there and doing what I want to do to them and not worrying about what they're going to do to me. So I'm not scared of anything really. Are you big on tape study, Chris? Have you watched a lot of Anderson fights preparing for this? No, I'm not really. I'm not really a huge on to that either. I just feel like um, when you do that, you over, if you don't consume too much video stuff and you're, over, you know, over, overlooking them, like overdoing that with the studying. I feel like you start worrying about a little bit too much of what they're going to do instead of what you're going to do. And uh, you might be in a position in the fight where, like, oh, no, I can't win this position. He's a better he's better in this position instead of being like, you know, it's good. You know, I'm better in this position, than, you know, even though you might have saw he was good on that in, in, on a page or whatever. Like, so I don't like to really, like, you know, study tape heavily. I get an idea of what, they're, what they do, what, what I have to watch out for. My coaches watch it and study it. As for me, I'm 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 doing what I want to do in there. I'm not worrying about what they're going to do. You know, I'm aware. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm very aware of what I'm going to do in every position. But I'm not I'm not studying every day to find out different little things and start, you know, knowing everything about the guy. I'm not I'm not used to that. You speak about the potential downsides of watching tape. I wonder. If that's something you actually experienced in your career, can you take us to a fight where you felt you perhaps studied too much? Uh, no, not really. In MMA, I, I always never really watched it. And I uh, came from you know, the rest of the hockey. My head coach, Tom Ryan, he was a Dan Gable disciple. He wrestled the Iowa under Dan Gable. And he had the same mentality. I liked his mentality. Was, this is a, you know, we could watch some tape, but he wasn't, like, big into it. He was just like, we're going to go out there and do what we're going to do, regardless of what they have to bring to the table. We're screw, like screw that. That we're gonna do what we want to do. We dictate what we want to do in that match, and that was kind of that Iowa mindset. Kind of I, I kind of, kind of took, and I and I think it works. I think it keeps you more positive and more. Uh, it gives you a more aggressive sound, less you know, worrisome about what they're gonna do. Yeah. We hear a lot of fighters put it pretty much the way you're putting it, Chris, and I don't know, I haven't done any kind of a study, but it wouldn't surprise me to hear that you have about a 50-50 success rate looking at the game that way, and there are probably a lot of guys who say no. I mean, the closer you watch each and every movement of, the, of your opponent, the better off you're going to be. Is this just something no, that I, feels right inside? I think everybody, and I think, everybody, I think everybody's different, too. I think some guys, you know, it benefits other guys. It doesn't. For me, 
I think it would be too much of a distraction. Uh, I, I like to just focus on what I'm doing. That's it. How do your two kids feel about you fighting Anderson Silva? How do what? How do your kids feel about you fighting Anderson? How do my kids feel? Well, my daughter's, my daughter's three, and my son is one, so they don't really know <laughs> what the heck's going on. <laughs> so much but, for um, that. I'm sure they'll be happy after the fight when I buy them something nice. <laughs> Love it. Well, this is uh, this interview is not designed to be about Anderson Silva at all. This is designed to be about oh, you. Okay. And and here we are, uh, right? You're you're on okay. the on the cusp, and people are more interested in you than ever. And and I want to start with you describing the neighborhood you grew up in. Tell us what it was like growing up, Chris Weidman. I uh, I grew up in a uh, diverse neighborhood, Baldwin, small town, Long Island. Um, I grew up doing I, I was doing a lot of fighting growing up. I had my older brother who was. Big, tough, scary, and I kind of lived in the shadows. She was a better athlete, you know, um, bigger, stronger, and all that stuff. And uh, so I always kind of had to, you know, go the extra mile to for people to even notice me. That was always Charlie's little brother. Which I remember my brother's name was Charlie. So I was always Charlie's little brother. I was never Chris. I was never wife and nothing. So I think I always had to work extra hard and. I had that like don't back down attitude because my brother would always have his friends like beating me up and. But I never gave up, and same thing with my brother. He'd always beat me up, and I'd still antagonize, you know, antagonize him and start with him. <laughs> I get beat up even more. So I don't know. I grew up just uh, tough playing a lot of sports and uh, kind of being tested from the beginning. Yeah, being tested. And it sounds like even though you knew it wasn't in your best physical interests, testing people back was that a way to get respect in your mind? To even though guys were kind of getting one over on you, to still get in their face. Yeah, I wasn't gonna just get bullied. I always, I, I always tried to give it back, even though, even if I was getting beat up. You know, there was a couple of times that I, you know, got my heart broken after getting, you know, beat up and sort of kind of manhandled. It's not a good feeling. You know, I remember <laughs> some kids were trying to steal my bike, and uh, I was always like a real smiley kid. I was just smiling for no reason, just have a smile on my face. <laughs> they came inside stealing my bike. I was smiling. He goes, and he, I, it was me and one of my friends, and he's like. He's like, what are you looking at, Smiley? And I'm going, Smiley. And they threw me off my bike. And I tried to get up and fire me, threw me back down. And it was just, I was just outmatched. I was done. And I just felt so discouraged. And, and I stopped smiling for a long time. I don't, I don't smile as much as I, I would have if that kid didn't do that to me. So he took away a lot of smiles. Very upset. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How, well, here, there's the smile again peeking through the phone as you prepare to fight Anderson Silva. I mean, uh, you yeah. definitely turned that, flipped that script around. How old were you then, Chris? Sorry. Uh probably like 8 to 10, something like that. Yeah. What? No. Well, first of all, where's that kid? Is he still in the neighborhood? Have You Did you get I, one? You know what? I don't even know. I, I don't know where that kid was from. I don't know where he was from, from around. I was, like, there was a point in my town, there was a lot of bike stealing going around. Mm. Like, I had probably about 10 bikes stolen, and I lived, I used to try to like, jump bikes right across from my house. It was great. I live on the Long Island Railroad system, so there's like some woods, and there was people come from all different towns and uh, ride their bikes in there and like, try to make jumps and jump bikes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of people stealing bikes, and kids would come from other towns, and like, the gangs would come. And I was, A lot of fighting with kids from out of town, too, growing up, which is always, uh, always fun. Were you, um, were you kind of unsure at that age what to do with that feeling where taking your bike and outmatching you like that, I mean, it, it left you real flat. To hear you say you weren't smiling, I mean, that, that must, have been a, must have been a confusing thing to deal with at that age. I was I'm just angry. I remember going back to my house, just crying out of just anger. Just wanted to. I wish I could have done something different, you know. Yeah. But uh, I always had my brother. My brother always picked on me, beat the crap out of me. But if something like that, if I would have got my brother, he would have helped me and beat the crap out of him for me. So. But you're saying so you, did, you that, didn't. I've done that. Yeah. I didn't do that on that occasion. There was one occasion where I actually I got beat up by a bunch of a bunch of crips. It's a big gang out here. You got the blood in the Crips. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of Crips came. They beat me up pretty good. And I said, and I told them, as they beat me up, and I was like, so, I'm still okay. I'm just like, you know, I was like, I'll get my freaking brother to beat the crap out of you guys. So, like, oh, yeah, where's he at? And I brought them to my house. <laughs> and my brother opens up the door, and there's like freaking six of each Crips outside. I'm like, Joel, are you kids are messing with me. And he's like, Chris, are you kidding me? <laughs> and my brother, he's like, Chris, get inside. And then my brother goes inside, gets a bow and arrow. He comes out saying, like, you guys got fun? And then they all, they all ran and never came back. Okay, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. A bow and arrow? A bow and arrow, yeah. <laughs> my brother was really crazy, by the way. Well, like, he was, uh, 
very loyal friend. If anybody had like a problem in the neighborhood, he was uh, he he's he was a guy people called. Is he still around? Does he go to your fights? Mm -hmm. uh, he's still around. Yeah, he's um he was a really good athlete. He went to he was a two time All American uh, football player and he blew out his knee. He had all like the credentials of going to NFL and and then uh, didn't happen. His knee his knee like the surgery he got. No no professional athlete has ever played a sport with the surgery surgery he got. He had like a cadaver put into his knee or something. Um, so it was real. It was real tough for him, uh, but he ended up becoming, like, he was literally crazy. He was, either he was going to be in the NFL or kill somebody, be in jail or dead. So, and then, uh, so after he had the knee surgery, he ended up being good for him because he became, like, a, pretty much like a born-again Christian. He ended up coming to God and, and uh, turned his life around. Now he has three kids, and he's not, like, a bad, scary guy anymore. Do you share that religion with, with your brother? Are you a religious guy, Chris? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um I mean, he is, uh, he's, like, that's more into it than me as far as, like, I mean, this, he can, like, tell you every Bible verse there is pretty much. He's, he's, I mean, that's his life. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, I think I have a pretty good relationship with guys always a struggle and always trying to, uh, self-improve yourself. And, uh, I think I'm always on a, trying to, like, a self-improvement type, uh, role. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I go to church with my family and try to do the right things, but, Again, I'm not perfect, and I think no one is, but i just always trying to get better with that, yeah. Now, of course, your moniker is All-American. Do you think there's anything about your upbringing, your childhood, your early life that's All-American? I mean, I don't know. I guess a little blue-collar neighborhood, and um, yeah, my dad had a... My dad had his own business. We built stars in Open A's in Long Island City, which is probably like the worst place of business as far as, like, just it's like hell out there. It's just like crazy cutthroat business, you know. And uh, we used to go out there and work with him. And I don't know. He grew up just we grew up, you know, tough. And you know, didn't have we didn't have everything we wanted. And just learned how to deal with that. And no, it was, I think it was good kind of upbringing. You know, the biggest thing is we have parents who loved us, and so we were blessed with that. You know, so yeah. No, I I don't know. Did the all American it's moniker? All American upbringing. Did the, did the, yeah, well, it's an all it's an all New York upbringing, which you know you could argue is all American, right? There's there's nothing more more American than New York in, in a lot of ways. So, did that nickname right, right. land in your lap because you were an all American in college and wrestling? No, it was more uh, when I went to the gym. They were they all knew when I, it ended up when I started doing MMA, and they all knew I was all American in college and all that stuff, and all wrestling. I wrestled I was all American in high school, college, all that stuff. But um, it was more. I might marry my high school sweetheart, you know, but I got, you know, a little bit of the old American look, I guess, and the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. So I guess it was more, I think it was more like marry my high school sweetheart, and I go to church, and I got a good looking face. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> Weidman is, is, uh, is what kind of name? In other words, what's the ethnicity of your family? It's Jewish. Okay. What, what was no, your dad? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Everybody <laughs> thinks it is so. Do, I was totally ready but, to accept that. Yeah, no, it would be great because I'd probably make a lot more money. That's everybody, all my Jewish friends, are like me. Just help people you do it. So I'm like, no, I can't do that. But uh, no, I'm. Uh, I'm. It's German Irish. Were your parents? I'm German Irish. Were your parents uh, American? My dad is. My dad's German and my mom's Irish. And yeah, my parents both were born in America, and um, their parents too, actually. Now, you mentioned uh, marrying your high school sweetheart as part of that story that led to the nickname. Tell us about your wife and, and how you met her and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so I met her when I was in fifth grade. Her brother and I, she was, when she was in fifth grade, I was in seventh grade. Her and her brother, her, her brother and I were uh, on the same wrestling team in junior high, and her father was bringing us to a, uh, the Granby camp in Virginia, and she happened to come for the ride to bring us all down, like a couple of wrestlers. And so that was the first time I met her. She was like in the back seat, and we were like, you know, a little flirtation going on. I'm seventh grade, she's fifth grade, she's a pretty cute looking girl. <laughs> I'm driving, I'm just, like, hey, whatever. But there was nothing obviously going on. That was just really young. That was when I first met her. Yeah. Uh, and then we did the whole Virginia uh, Granby camp, and then she ended up having to move to. Uh, Louisiana. She was from Hawaii, and then she went. She came to New York. She was in New York for a couple of years. That's why I met her. And she had, then she moved to Louisiana uh, for a couple of years, <clears throat> and then she came back to New York in tenth grade. And when she was in tenth grade, I was a senior, 
And when she came back, I started kind of, you know, me and her brother were both captains on the wrestling team, and it was a little tough at first telling the brother I like her sister, like your sister, but ended up ended up working out against her, and that was it from yeah, there. You mentioned involvement in wrestling at such a young age. Uh, you, the story has been told that when you were a kid, you joined the Bald, Baldwin Kid Wrestling Program, and um, there's something out there on the Friends of Long Island Wrestling website where your father uh, kind of tells the story about how you know, you put on a singlet um, and and you had you didn't take it off. I think after your first meet or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell tell us that. Tell us about your first kind of experience with the mat. I love. I just. I absolutely loved it because I was. I was. You know. I was at the top of the brother, like you said. Like so, I was always getting beat up by bigger and stronger guys. And and uh, when I when I started doing that, I was like finally like I was able to you know learn how to defend myself and. I just loved, I loved like, you know, the, the, what wrestling is, it's just, you know, the, the competition of being able to, to, you know, manhandle and just, you know, throw around people and, and learn how to do it right. And, you know, it was just fun as a kid to, like, you know, roll around and, like, horse play or whatever. It was good to get energy out, and it was, it was fun, you know. And I don't know. I, I think I always just, just loved it ever since I just, the smell of even walking into the restaurant room, even though it stinks. Yeah. There's something about it that just, you know, resonated inside me, and I just never stopped loving it. It's interesting always to talk to, and I don't know if this was exactly your situation, but to talk to future MMA fighters who were wrestlers as kids, and MMA really wasn't a crystal clear career path at the time. It was in its formative stages, and even in high school, Chris, um, did you see MMA as what you would end up doing with your wrestling skills, or did you think you would do something totally different? No, I didn't see that happening. <clears throat> Definitely not. But I always, I was always. I remember in high school thinking, especially like in the beginning, if I was like a, when I was like a freshman, I was wrestling varsity, and there's some guys a lot bigger and stronger than me. But I remember thinking in my head, even if I can't beat them in wrestling, I can beat them in a fight. Like I always have that <laughs> in the back of my mind. You know, I could beat them in a, in a fight, but um, I didn't think of it as like a career path or anything like that. But I remember, I remember in, in high school, I was always, you know, trying to. I love the contact sports. I remember boxing. Like, we have the toughest kids from the high school come to go to, like, an elementary school and just beat the crap out of each other, boxing gloves, and have bad headaches. And I remember senior year leaving lunch a couple times with a couple friends and going back and, like, trying to submit each other. And I didn't even know what a submission was, but I was doing something. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was so I was into it, but I didn't even think of like, UFC or anything like that. You mentioned submissions. Where did you pick up on the idea of submissions if you weren't totally aware of UFC? I don't I don't know if someone else was watching it. I wasn't watching it. I don't know if one of my other friends were watching it and they, they were kind of like talking about it, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. I can't tell you. I can I can make something up and lie about it right no, now. No, no, please don't. Please like, don't. Yeah. <laughs> so you I just show where. up you just show up senior year and guys are like, we're going to do submissions and you're like, yeah, all right, whatever that is. I don't is. know. Yeah, it was 2002, so I don't know what was going on with that? But yeah, we yeah we would go back to my house and we do that. And we had a wrestling mat at my house. That's why. So we do that. We do the submission stuff down there. And we also had boxing gloves. We just box all the time. And so I was always doing that. I mean, of course, I thought I knew how to box, but I didn't. I didn't really understand what boxing was until I got that event. But. Yeah, I want to get a little deeper into that idea of if I fought this kid, I'd beat him, even if he beat me on the wrestling mat. Um, what did you envision? that meaning to fight him as opposed to wrestle him? You know, like beat him up. <laughs> no, but I mean punch like... Him face, take him down. Simply punches, that's all you pictured? Is, is just a fight? It's like a straight fight. Like think of like a high school fight. I don't know, beat him up. Like just, he puts his hands up, I put my hands up and we fight. I win. <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, I feel you on that. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering like if that's... If that's all, like knowing how deep and complex and three-dimensional fighting is now as you do, is it kind of funny to look back and think, all I'd have to do to beat this kid up who was out wrestling me is punch him in the face? Because, I don't know, that that would have worked? You, you felt confident, even knowing what you know about oh. fighting now? No, yeah, I just think, yeah, who knows? Who knows? I, you know, it's funny, I remember getting in a fight, and I, I was like in second, third grade, it was like, I just been wrestling for like a year, and I remember hitting the, like the perfect double leg on somebody, taking them down, beating them up. Wow. My next door neighbor actually threw a, he threw a brick at one of my other friends, and with a, had a nail in it, and it went to the kid's neck, and he was bleeding like Ooh. literally 
like a horror movie bleed. Oh. So I went over to his house, I slapped him in the face, and then took him down with the perfect double leg and started ground the pounding him. <laughs> that is so awesome. Did you? Mom um, came out and was going crazy. Did you shoot the double leg out of instinct, or did you think, "Oh, I'm gonna do this"? I, oh no, it was like it was like the way you, the first like if elementary school kid would learn how to do a double leg, it was like step between, put your heel down, toe, knee. It was like it was like yeah, it was good. So you mean you did it methodically? You did it like okay, one, two, three. Yeah, it was. It was. I think it was pretty smooth, but it was like perfect technique. Like you don't really need to hit your knee on a takedown if a guy's standing straight. But I hit my knee and like did it the exact right way that they're teaching in wrestling. You know, it's funny. Now you were two-time Division One All-American at Hofstra. You placed third in the NCAA tournament your senior year. You fought, wrestled rather, two uh, future name fighters in Ryan Bader and Phil Davis. Beat both of them. What do you remember about those two matches? With Bader and Davis? Yeah. Uh, uh, Phil Davis, he was, uh, it was a dual meet at Hofstra, and, um, uh, he was, he was seeded number one, I think I was seeded number three, like, ranked number, he was ranked number one in the country, I was ranked number three, so it was known as, like, going to be a really good match, and, uh, it was a good match, you know, he's, he was good. Um, I was always, like, small, a little smaller for the weight, for 197, you know, obviously, you could look at Bader and, and, and Dave, Phil Davis, and tell they're a little bit bigger than me, but, um. And I ended up uh, winning like 6-4 in that match. It was a really good match. High pace and the crowd was going crazy and I ended up winning. And then um, Ryan Bader was in Nationals. He was quarterfinals. I beat the number one seed. Uh, it was my junior year. I beat the number one seed the round before that. And then um, in the quarterfinals was Bader. And it was really another exciting match. I think I beat him like 13 to 9 or something. Like high, pretty high scoring. And... Um, yeah. Now the Phil Davis, Matt. the Phil Davis win for, in particular. What? How did you beat him? What? If you had to point to maybe one or two things that you had the edge on him on, what would they be? Um, I don't know. I, I, he didn't take me down. I took him down. I think twice. Mm. He. I can't remember the match completely, but yeah. So I won the takedowns. Takedowns it was. So to see. Takedowns. He was good at. He was good. Really good at riding, and I was able to. He chose top. I think. And then uh, I reversed him, and I pretty much I think I rode him out for the win. Now, do you see flashes like if you watch one of your fights and watch one of his fights in mixed martial arts in 2013? Do you see flashes of those those uh, that that matchup from from years back today, or does a wrestler's wrestling change so much so drastically when they adapt it for MMA that there's really nothing left of what they went to in their toolbox on the collegiate mats? No, you could see you could still see a lot of, um, but you're not. It's totally different. Wrestling, wrestling, and uh, MMA wrestling are two completely different sports. But you still carry over a lot of the same stuff that you'd be doing. Um, as far as like control, your style, um, different things you might be good at, and not good at. And um, Phil was always a goer, like, and always really good on top, top control. So even in his fights now, you can see he's very like positionally sound on top and he's always looking to push push the pace when he gets the top of somebody and yeah he has an aggressive pace and um and uh ryan bader was more of an explosive guy and you see that you know he needs that explosive pace down yeah so yeah uh, lift and different. slam like, people phil, yeah. Phil, yeah phil might take a couple more shots to get the to get the one he needs um but to keep going for that has the energy and, and ryan needs to set up like another you know, one or two really good explosive takedowns you know now, what's your frame frame of mind at this point, Chris? We talked about high school and wrestling, and the idea of whether that was leading to anything professionally. By the time you got to Hofstra and wrestling against, you know, two former future UFC contenders, was mixed martial arts on your mind by then, or still no? Um, no, still not really. So I mentioned it to my, was probably my fiance at the time, or girlfriend at the time. I don't know. And she she, she wasn't having it, so I was like, hey, I'm not going to argue with it. Whatever. I'm like. She's not doing that, I guess. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And so so not, not, not at the time of wrestling them. I don't think I was thinking about doing that. Man. Now, I think, your, I think your senior year was 2007, correct? Yeah. And that was derailed as far as going for a championship by a wrestler named Josh Glenn from American. And, um, yeah. and tell us about getting to third in the NCAA tournament, because we always talk about the champion from the NCAAs, but when you look back, you know, the runners-up, third place, fourth place, they've been just as big a force in the mixed martial arts ranks. I mean, you're talking about inches when it comes to what makes the difference between an NCAA champ. Yeah, 
Yeah, those those scar you, man. I wanted to win that national tournament really bad, and uh, I was winning that match when I lost too. I got caught, pissed me off. Never, I'll never get over it. But uh, yeah, then I ended up wrestling back and wrestling good. I I think I, I pretty much killed everybody going back wrestling for third and fourth. Beat some beat some really good guys. Um, some some guys that are still competing at the world world trial level and doing well. So it was it was good. Well, but, in, rest, uh, was, in wrestling on, you helped Hofstra to its highest team finish ever, right? Yeah, our team was unbelievable. We beat, uh, beat um, University of Minnesota, who was ranked one that year. That never, that they, they didn't lose to any other team but us. We beat Penn State, uh, Lehigh, Michigan. I think we we beat we could have beat any team in the country that year. Uh, we actually underperformed the nationals. I think I could have won nationals. I think there was maybe one other guy that could have won nationals, and we could have actually had a couple more All Americans. Um, but we still placed the highest hosts in our place, and uh, our team our team was really really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's something to wrestle on after such a crushing, you know, defeat as far as what your hopes and dreams were. Um, you mentioned you'll never get over it. Is there a, f- a moment in particular in the match that 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 really grinds at you? That really you wish if you just changed that, you would be NCAA champ. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of things from my college career that I'm I'm happy and I'm 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 happy that I didn't win nationals to be honest with you because it's one of those things that keeps that fire burning inside me now. If I would have accomplished that goal, if I would have felt like holding the goal for me at that time, I probably wouldn't have the, the burning desire to compete at this level I'm at now and, and, and truly want to win so bad uh, this, this this title. You know, it's, um, So I think uh, I think everything happens for a reason. I think it was a good thing. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly, I your, certainly your MMA campaign speaks to that. Uh, do you feel like sometimes... It might have been helpful in your first two, three, four pro fights to have a loss as well, so you could have that similar, uh, you know, similar drive, similar um, fire. No, no, I'm done with losing. Um, I don't need that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you've proven that. So, so, yeah. so, so that, so that match. I mean, it's 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 interesting to hear, you know, because we've had uh, Johnny Hendricks on the show, we've had Ben Askren on the show, we've had a lot of guys who have gone deep, deep into you know NCAA collegiate tournaments and, and won them and things like that and and and, and even you know Ben Askren of course um, rather famously or infamously couldn't make the Olympics and and he was just everyone's thought as a sure thing and you were looking at the Olympics as well but uh, what was your mindset as far as pursuing the Olympics not winning the NCAA title did you feel like it was just as possible or did you feel like maybe that loss told you something about going in a different direction uh, no, I thought it was possible uh, with the wrestling because I'm, I mean, I'm, I go with guys and I know where I, where I'm at when I'm training and I know where I'm at when I, I I've beaten some really good guys, you know, that done well. So I know where I'm at. It was just a matter of putting it together, having the right mindset. Um, it took me, it took a lot of those losses, even with training for Olympics and going through the setbacks, to really learn how to have like uh, a winner's mindset. Hang on one second. Sure. Hang on, hang on one second. No problem. No problem. I just got no the problem. Uh, no, it's definitely on this side. It's actually over here. I know where it is. Are we on the other side here? Oh, yeah. We're on the other side, bro. We're going to go on the other side. Hello? Hey, man. Yeah, sorry about that. That's no problem. So, so you're talking about the winning mindset and how uh, failing in the bid for the Olympics. Because you tried out for the team, um, and, and tell us how that went. What was that experience like in 2008? Uh, for what team? For the, oh, Olymp- the Olympics? For the Olympic wrestling team, uh, yeah. yeah I, ended up, I ended up getting injured uh, before the trials, so I didn't even get to go to the trials. Uh, so I didn't, it was pretty much a letdown of a year. I was coaching at Hoshi University. I was getting my master's degree. Um, yeah, so it was a pretty much uh, a letdown of a year. But I, I think it was good. You know, I know. I, I honestly, I think everything happened for a reason, as far as just my the other stuff to get me where I'm at now. You know. Did you think at the time that you might try to still go for the team in 2012? Yeah, that was that was the. Uh, it was either I'm trying out for the 2012 Olympics and trying to make the world teams in between, or I'm going to uh, trust MMA, and that's pretty much when I uh, started messing around with the MMA. It was after that. Started going for it. Uh, you were living. In your parents' house at the time, right? Yep, my parents' basement. Yep. Now, were you living there with your fiance or girlfriend or wife even at that point, or what was the situation? Yeah, um, yeah, at that point, yep, I was living there with uh, my fiance. Yep. 
what was that like to 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 be such an elite college wrestler to be uh you know a learned studied we'll talk about the fact that you studied psychology at Hofstra and things like that uh to to live in your parents basement a lot of people talk about that being the problem with with college graduates today is they have no choice but to do that because the finances what was that like I'll tell you what man yeah no it's not fun it's hard you go to school you you try to do the right things and then you realize when you get out you're well especially after you got my master's sixteen thousand dollars worth of debt and uh you know I mean I could have with a psychology degree, you definitely need to go get your master's. So it was basically like, oh, go back to school and be poor for another two years. Um, that's when I was doing a lot of private lessons and stuff. Hey, what's up? Hey, I'll tell you, I'm on my interview. So. Hello? Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I just got off the subway, and I'm getting hounded. <laughs> uh, By people who, uh, who want to wish you well or people you know? No, that was someone that um, wants to wish me well for the fight. Just some random dude. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah, hang on. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got it. I got it. Um, sorry about that. Go ahead. That's, that's fine. Hey, I understand. There's a pretty big fight coming up. People this whole interview, I want people to know, don't think I'm a retard. I've been multitasking. I'm not yeah. good at multitasking. <laughs> right. You can hear the subway bells and whistles in the back and everything. It's actually kind of a, uh, it's kind of nice ambient sound. It makes for a nice effect in some ways. All right. Um, all right. Good. So, so there you are, right? You got your two degrees. What are you going to do? Go even further into debt? It's like, what do you do? Yeah, no, I, I agree, man. I feel like everybody's told to go to college, and it's just so overpriced, and uh, there's, like, no jobs right now. So it's, like, yeah, definitely tough for a lot of people out there. I'm, I mean, I'm definitely blessed to where I'm at now, um, you know, because there was, a, there was a point where I was doing, I was really struggling, man. I was just training. I was, tra- I, I, you know, especially when you first start doing MMA. Like, when you first started doing MMA, I obviously not making any money. I would, I would, and I had to go keep going to school. That was my whole deal, Marie, with my wife, too. If we're going to do MMA, i got to get my master's. So I was doing that at the same time. And uh, pretty much my whole day was consisted of school, training, and private lessons anytime in between to make, extra, to make money so I could live. And the private lessons, it got to the point where the only times I had private lessons were from like 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock at night. So I had people coming from 12, 10 to 12. And I'm up the next morning, like 7 a.m. I was doing student teaching. It was uh, tough times, sometimes. Yeah, well, I got past that point, though. Yeah, it sounds like a real, I don't know, it, it, there's just nothing on the other end. You know, like you said, it's what you're told to do, and, and sometimes you find that that's just not going to, to make much of a difference. So how big, yeah. of a, how big of a factor were finances in choosing MMA over 2012 Olympics? Because if you were to train for the world, world team and make the world team and win the world, and, I mean, there's no money there either. Hang on one second. You said how big was how big was it? What? How big of a factor was money? Because if you wanted to go for the 2012 games, there's no money in in doing that. No, it was it was huge. You know, you saw a lot of these wrestlers and, and guys who were doing good with this, and they were making a living for the family. And that's all about. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to become. You know, I was never into becoming like a millionaire or anything like that. I just want to be able to live comfortably. That's it. Just live decently comfortable. For me and my family, I'm a happy man. That's all I needed. And uh, at the time, I was assistant coaching at Hofstra and, and you know, making probably like $16,000 a year, making more than that with private lessons. And in New York, especially Long Island, it's hard to live on that. I mean, especially when you get, you already have a family. So it was, money was definitely a big part of it. You know, I need to find a way to take care of my family, you know. And, that, and that, I found that's, when I stopped assistant coaching at Hofstra, I lost that 16000 I had to find a way to, uh, come up with that money, so, you know, I started doing a lot of other stuff, too, so. Yeah, but well, did you take a lot of odd jobs? Were you doing a lot of, well, when you say other yeah, stuff? Yeah, I was doing, I was working, land, I was landscaping with one of my friends, doing landscaping, I was, I've done, I've done every job in the book. Yeah. But that was probably the, uh, the one I was doing the most when I was doing MMA, I was landscaping, I used to come in to raise, with cuts all over my body from freaking going through bushes and Sticking bushes and stuff like that. And he's like, "What the heck are you doing? You gotta stop doing this." I'm like, "What do you want me to do? I gotta get my wife." And I'm, at, the, at that time, I might have been just getting getting ready to have my daughter. Mm-hmm. So like, I gotta gotta work. You know? I mean, here here's Chris Weidman. Uh, I think a um, a bachelor's right, a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's in physical education, uh, third place runner up in the in the nationals in the NCAA wrestling, and you're working as a landscaper. <laughs> Yes, poor me. 
Someone help me. <laughs> no, no. It's just it's what happens sometimes. It's it's amazing how oh, I know, yeah. how it how sometimes it all adds you up. You know what? I think uh, some I think you might be better off just not going to college and just becoming a landscaper from the get go. Yeah. Like hey. one of my, my my friend who I was doing it with. This kid he has his own business now. It's just him working, and uh, I'll probably get him killed by people but he's i mean he's off the books on like pretty much everything the guy's making a good living for himself and, yep um you know it's it's a great living and and, and he you know so he is a, his his sister his both his sisters are one's a cpa the other one's, the other one's a lawyer and he's a landscaper but um you know it's it's a tough job but i think it's it's good money you know yeah. if you if you're able to if you're if you're able to work hard it's good money were you doing landscaping chris on like rich people's houses and things like that seeing how the other half live uh, you know, it's funny. I was saying, you know, I'm thinking about it. I was doing it with my friend sometimes, the friend I was telling you about who has his own business. He was just kind of paying, he was paying me, like, hourly. And then I was also working for this other guy. Uh, he was a supporter of the Hops Wrestling program. I was pretty much like his personal assistant. I'd just ride around with him, and he'd have me landscape. He owned, like, a couple of different, um, you know, warehouses, and I'd, I'd have to, he'd drop me off there with, like, lawnmower equipment and stuff, and I'd landscape all around the warehouses, just me by myself. Huh. And uh, I'd be there for the whole day. And I'd go inside. Like, you might have me work inside the warehouse doing stuff. Or, and then, uh, but then he'd always take me out for lunch. He was always a good guy. Guy Savage. He, was, he, he took care of me. So sure. I, was, uh, I, was, I, was, I was doing that for a while, too. It was actually pretty good. That parent's house that, that you lived at, um, I'm not clear on this. Did that survive Hurricane Sandy? Yeah, that was just further from the water. So that was they were good to go. That's where I lived. I lived there for like the four months afterwards. That's my house got destroyed. So I was, I was back there again. Yeah, back to it. So you had bought, what? Well, that was your first house with your wife, right, that got destroyed in the hurricane? Yeah, yep, yep. Is that nightmare over from the kind of financial perspective, or are you still dealing with insurance and stuff like that? No, I'm still dealing with that. I'm still dealing with insurance. We own the house, we own the house with my cousin and, and his family, too, so it's... It's uh, even more of a nightmare because we have to, like, split things between the families, who lost what, how much. It's a big headache with all that stuff, too, so it's it's uh, complicated. But uh, my wife kind of lets me not worry about it as much. I'm, I got, like, more of a laid-back attitude about things. And, you know, everything, you know, is going to work out, and my wife is more more worried about things than me, so she, she's, she's dealing with that more than me. <laughs> did, did you find it hard to not break down or have a crack in that laid back personality when when mother nature did that to your home? Um, you know, I when I was when I was going through it, I you know, I was home when it happened. I was I was like when it was happening, this water's coming to my house destroying everything. I'm just like it was surreal, you know, you didn't think it was you thought tomorrow, you know, you thought the next day the water goes away, you're back to home and living. And then nine months later, whatever it is now, it's still not back. You know, it's just it's crazy would amend and I didn't really understand how crazy it was until all the other families start coming back from wherever they, you know, ran away to. When they start coming back the next day or the two days later, whatever it was, and they were like hysterically crying. Mm. I'm like, What the heck? This is pretty serious, huh? I'm like, Yeah, I guess my house is pretty much destroyed. This is not good Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was it's tough. But you know what the way the way I dealt with it and the way I think it to a difficult race. Yeah, you race um uh, and the, the way I dealt with it was just kind of just natural. Uh, there's just other people who are a lot worse off than me. You know, there's, you know, my next-door neighbor, he's 80 some years old, and he retired, and he has his wife, and uh, they only had a one-story house, and they had no flood insurance, and, you know, he worked his ass off his whole life. He's a blue-collar guy. Uh, did, he was a contractor and worked his whole butt off, saved to enjoy his retirement, and all of a sudden now he has to put everything he's ever worked for into his house and, and rebuild it and go through basically something at this age, you can just tell it aged him so much, just, you know, you know, took the wind out of him, mm. you know, and uh, so I always, you know, I focus on guys like that, you know, I just, I'm not trying to sound like I'm that good of a guy or anything, but I think it's just almost this human nature to take your mind off it, you start thinking about other people, yeah. you know, like I, I'd be at my parents' house because they actually had electric and we're watching all the, all the devastation on TV and I'm like, wow, this is crazy and it's funny, it's like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, wow, this is actually my house, and this is my life that they're talking about, but I'm, I'm actually thinking about the other people, not even myself. I'm just like, this is weird. You know, I think it's just almost a way to cope. I can but, understand um, what you mean. Did you guys buy a new house, or did you build a new house? How did you rebound? 
now we're still fixing the, the, the house that we had, and we're probably going to we're gonna look to move out of the house. The value of the house is down like you wouldn't believe, just being on the water at this point. So, uh, I mean, me and my wife, we win this fight. We're going to, I got to win this fight, and then hopefully get out of there. Wow. Oh, so you, to, to get out of the, there's a lot riding on this fight, Chris. Will Chris Weidman's family get out of the eye, out of the eye of the next hurricane? <laughs> I know, I know. You know, global warming, we're pretty much screwed. So yeah, I we got to get up north. Every every so many months, something like this happens in some some city somewhere. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, with that with that backdrop to what's going on, um, you know, that was part of why you beat Mark Munoz, um, and you were sort of touted as a guy could he be the next challenger and you know you were supposed to fight uh, Tim Boach that didn't happen you were dealing with that a big part of the delay was it kind of like man I would have had to win probably two more fights to get this title fight if that hadn't happened oh uh, sorry one more time no problem Chris not at all um, you know that that accounted for some of the delay. You beat Mark Munoz. People were saying, "Is this guy going to be the next title challenger?" And you know, you haven't fought since then. Part of it was dealing with with Sandy, um, and part of it was was injuries and things like that. But I mean, if that hadn't happened to you, you might have had to fight once or two more times to get the title shot. You know, but here you are because of all of the timing and the way it worked out. It's kind of funny in that way. I I really think it's crazy, man. I think I, I'm, I even when I got hurt and Hurricane I just thought. Everything happens for a reason, you know. I'm not gonna. I never cried about it. I'm never. I never really, like plugged out too much. Thanks a lot, man. Okay. Um, so I felt. Um, I felt everything happened. I thought. I thought something good was gonna come out of it. I didn't expect. To be honest, I didn't. At that point, I, I kind of gave hope up. Gave up hope on the uh, Silver thing. But um, it, everything worked out even better than I could have imagined. And and here we are. You know, two weeks out from fighting the guy I've been wanting to fight since the day I got into the sport, and just. Uh, it's amazing how things work out, and I'm excited. Have you ever gotten a really good idea from anybody as to what ultimately convinced Anderson to take the fight? Uh, I think uh, I think Lorenzo Fertitta, when he decides to make something happen, it happens, and I think he uh, he decided him and the UFC I guess decided that's what they wanted to do, and that was it. You know. Um, I don't think Anderson's going to be, you know, saying no too much to them. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the dynamic, right? Is Dana, Dana's in the weeds with the guys, with, with all the talent on negotiations on fights like this, and, and if he needs to, he calls in Lorenzo, and, and Lorenzo has a way of closing the deal and maybe sweetening the pot a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, well, who, yeah, who knows? I know Lorenzo because Lorenzo's the one who told me that we're, I've been on fighting Anderson. We're lobbying for MMA in New York, and we're just talking or whatever, and then he goes, oh, by the way, if you're fighting Anderson on July 6th, I spoke to him like two days ago he was with him like in the city in New York I'm like really that's pretty awesome man why didn't you tell me that as soon as you saw me like <laughs> yeah right you're like full conversation about other things and oh by the way you're fighting for the world how is that not the like, first order of business yeah I know that's what did you, you know like, I had a lot going on what did you do when you hung up the phone no it was in person I was on the I was just finished I was oh. we're talking like you know, we're, we're live here for MMA together in New York in Albany so right. it's just he was there. He just told me, I'm like, whoa, I, I gave him a hug. I'm like, I love you. Thank you so much. And that's it. That's great. Tell me about meeting Matt Serra for the first time. Uh, I mean, the first time was just like, I was going to his academy. I was just in the classes, and I think he, like, came in the door. And, you know, you know, he's like a ball of energy, so he's loud and talking. And I remember I, he, I was, like, starstruck. You know, he's a big deal from Long Island and, you know, first, like, star guy I probably ever even been around. So it was, like, almost like being, I was kind of, like, starstruck, you know? Now, you, I mean, you, got, like, you uh, got connected with his academy, Chris, through um, Gabriel Toribio, right? Yeah, uh, yep, yep, and Pete Sell, you know, that's right, I was helping them with their wrestling at uh, Hofstra. And uh, they convinced me to come down and do some jiu-jitsu. And, uh, well, I only, yeah, I mean, just to come down and, you know, start learning some jiu-jitsu, and that's when I... That's when I started. Right. How did you know? How did you know Gabriel? Yeah, he, uh, he was actually in my. Uh, well, I knew him. He was a bouncer at uh, a couple of bars in the Hofstra area, so I knew him a little bit from there. And then um, he was in my Spanish class at Hofstra. Oh, really? Okay. And so he said, "I'm doing this jujitsu. Yeah. You're a wrestler. Come try it out." Yeah. 
Yep. Now you studied psychology there. Uh, do you feel like your studies there in that field um, ha have anything to do with your success as a fighter? Yeah, I think it. I think it. I think it definitely helps. Uh, it just teach me. You know, reaffirms the right way to have your mind and how to have a winner's mindset and how different people think and. Um, yeah, I think it. I think it definitely helps a lot. Actually, you know, just knowing how to train your mind. You know, putting good habits into your mind, and uh, yeah, I think it helps. Did you take up psychology thinking you might want to be a psychologist one day? <laughs> I pick up psychology uh, because you know, I want obviously wrestle in college, and I was trying to. I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, and mm -hmm. then. Um, I was kind of interested. I took a psychology class, like a beginner thing somewhere, and I kind of liked it. And then um, I was like, yeah, let me try psychology. And I gave it a shot. And I was actually, at first, I was psychology with a minor in business. And then I gave up the minor in business thing. And I just started with, uh, I stuck with psychology. I, it was just interesting, really interesting to me. A lot of different studies they were doing. And it was just like real life, factual, informational stuff that I, I liked, you know, and it was, uh, it was cool. Sure. You know who else studied psychology is Phil Baroni, and uh, we had him on the show a few years ago, and you can tell by the way he's looking back on his career and the way he sums up, like, not just what happened in his life, but, like, what came of it is because, you know, he, he understands psychology, It's and it's probably part yeah. of the reason why he was so good at marketing his fights is because he understands the psychology of the fans and what they what they want to hear. Um do you, do you feel that way? Do you feel like when you look around at all the other fighters, because you've studied psychology, you kind of have like this edge or this insight that they don't? They're kind of blind to certain things that are going on that make a big difference in the sport. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I don't think I don't hold my head up like, oh, I know more than you. No, know, this and that. But I, I, there's some things I do think I've learned that I've unconsciously just have, and I don't even realize. It. You know, I just think I understand what people. I, I think, you know, kind of what you're saying about Bernie, like I, I know what, you know, what people like and don't like, and I know what type of reactions people might have with certain things. Um, but I don't really, I like kind of just being myself instead of, you know, playing with that too much, but you got you do have to entertain the, the fans, and you got to do, you got to sometimes say things that might not be totally you, but just kind of a, um, a like a, just a different little version uh, like a like a stronger, more like uh, you know, just kind of a little bit more confidence than than you you know you just want to talk a little like if you're a little bit unsure about something you want to make sure you're not unsure about it. you want to at least you know talk like you're sure about it so I think you have to you have to do that as far as like talk about the fights. Stuff like that. It's a tricky thing though because fans after a while and and fighters and opponents right they when they hear I'm 100%, I'm better than I've ever been, I'm going to I'm gonna knock this guy out. It's like every fighter says that because, like you say, you have to talk yourself into that. Yeah. You have to be a little better yeah. than that, though, Chris. You can't, right? You have to be a little better to make people really believe what you're saying. Yeah, but you know, you know what's crazy is that the truth, truth of the matter is this. You don't know if you're going to knock him out. You don't know if you're going to win. There's, there's, you just don't know. You know, the only thing you really have control over is going out there and working as hard as you possibly can and, and trying your best not to beat yourself, you know, and, and just doing the best you can. You don't know the result. You don't know what the result's going to be. But you can't you can't say that. You have to say, you know, if you think you're going to knock them out, you're saying, yeah, I'm going to knock them out, you know. That, that's pretty much, I think, the gist of it. Yeah. Now, you took to Brazilian jiu-jitsu like a real savant. I mean, it was pretty insane how in so little time, I mean, it was almost... I don't want to go too far, but it was almost BJ Penn esque how just naturally you understood, you seemed to understand so quickly what it took to submit a guy using what you brought to the table. It wasn't like you were trying to be like this super scientific jujitsu player who could do every single thing perfectly. You just knew what to go for and what to build on that built on what you already brought to the table. So, can you describe to us kind of how you took to BJJ and, and as you did, were people around you kind of like, like that's amazing. You're how can you do that already w without really training this at all? Yeah, I definitely had that that whole thing going on when I first started, and I think it was just I was really open-minded. I'm extremely competitive, and 
um, I wanted to be the best at it, you know, and I felt like I had the tools to do it, and I was going to do everything I can to be the best at it, and, and, I, and I'm just constantly thinking about it all day long, you know, if I'm, if I'm learning moves, and, 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 and when I was doing jiu-jitsu, I was, I was thinking about it all day long when everybody else was doing whatever they're doing and thinking about different things, I'm still thinking about those moves, and when I come in the next day, and people be like, how the heck are you doing that, you just learned that yesterday, you just even learned that today, like, I, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a, almost a sickness to where I still have that problem. I'm just constantly visualizing every day things I'm doing. I always, I'm like, I'm my a, I'm a biggest, crit, biggest critic. Every day I want to be, I want to shine. You know, every day I want my coaches to be proud of me. Every day I want them to be like, this kid's a freak. You know, and, I, and every day I try my best to to do that. You know, to, I want to say, uh, where are we? Okay. Uh, every day I'm just trying to, uh, you know, build on that and, and, and just make a better fight every day. I don't want, you know, I don't, know, I don't know what it is, but yeah. Can you tell us something that you visualized today about the Anderson Silva fight? Yeah, I, about the Anderson Silva fight. I can't give away all my. I can't give it away. You can't. It's that specific, huh? You got to see July sixth. <laughs> Only on I paper. Some, I got some. I got. I got some good stuff, man. I, I really feel like uh, people. I haven't scratched the surface of what I. What. what uh, what I could do out there yet, and I haven't been able to really shine the way I want to shine yet on a lot of different aspects of the sport. I'm just excited that I had the opportunity to shine, you know, against Anderson Silva, who everybody, you know, thinks is the greatest of all time and thinks is untouchable, and I'm excited to uh, make him real and uh, kind of expose him, you know, not taking away anything about how good he is, but I just think that um, I step ahead, I step ahead with a lot of the things I'm going to you know, okay, that's now, in jiu-jitsu as well as in MMA, anaconda choke, very much your calling card. You, you, you're really good at getting it. But just guard passing in general is just something that it seems like you have a preternatural ability to be able to do. Just just phenomenal at guard passing. Do you remember in first learning jiu-jitsu a particular insight where suddenly it totally made sense to you how to pass guard, or was it just something you could do easily? Um. I think I started, I actually started all my jiu-jitsu, my first three months, I was on my back, most of most of jiu-jitsu, because I knew that was the area, they were like, oh, wrestlers aren't good on their back, so I wanted to spend all my time on my back. So I think I learned how to pass guard from other guys trying to pass my guard. Mm. Uh, I refused to go on top of people, on top of people, on top of people, because I knew that was going to be the thing that came the easiest to me. So, um, yeah, like, you got to move, you freaking idiot. <laughs> um, freaking guy standing in the middle of the street looking at me like I'm not here. Can I drive by? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, On the mean street, but, uh, Chris Weidman. Oh, my gosh. I'm actually dropping off one of the boy who came out here to with me. I'm dropping his bag off at the hotel because him and his dad are in the city and they stayed in the city. So I'm bringing the bag back to his hotel for him. For Chris, him. Chris, I know you're a nice guy, but you shouldn't be doing bag runs two weeks before a middleweight title fight against Anderson Silva. You just shouldn't. Hey man, you gotta you can't ever think you're too good to do things like this. Yeah, yes. I'm, they're they're great guys, and uh, anything I can do to help them. I'm <laughs> of course, that was even, it's like that story of John Jones after he beats Ryan Bader before he knows he's going to be the the boss at two o five. Walk run wandering around hotels in Vegas looking for a cab. Bruce Buffer tells that story, and it's like John. You can't just be walking around like this. You're, you're going to be a massive. You're going to, you know, you're going to get a title shot next. And he's, he's looking for a cab in the MGM Grand. <laughs> That's funny. Now uh, you talk about yep. guard passing and things like that. Why do you think you're able to capitalize on openings? W w you know, some guys they they don't right. Some guys just can't. They, you know, how hard they train, they're not as good at seeing openings and attacking them. Why do you think you're good at that, in particular with submissions? Uh, I think I just have an aggressive, pressure-based style where um, I'm just I'm, I'm constantly trying to make it uncomfortable, uncomfortable for them. So as soon as they get me in half guard or guard, they're comfortable. So I refuse to let them do that. I'm constantly, if I'm stuck in half guard or guard, I'm getting out of there fast, you know, as fast as I possibly can, and I'm going to constantly be looking to pass to make them uncomfortable because when they're uncomfortable, they're stressing, and when they're stressing, they're getting tired. So mm. I'm all about trying to break people, you know, so I'm just going to constantly be moving. With just one year of serious jiu-jitsu training, you were in uh, the the 2009 Abu Dhabi Submission World Championships uh, in Barcelona, Spain, and you faced Andre Galvao, and you lost to Andre Galvao, but you know certainly no one uh, 
to, you know, took you to task for that because of how quickly you had, you had ascended. Was there anything about losing to Galvao in, in jiu-jitsu that felt at all like losing to Glenn in the NCAAs, or did it feel like a less of a big deal? Uh, no, when I lost to when I lost to Andre Galvao, it was um, I, w- I wasn't I wasn't upset with myself. I, I kind of lo- I t- the only thing I was upset about myself was that I didn't really understand the rules. And I think if I would have understood the rules, I think I could have won. Um, but because there were some things I did that was just stupid, that everyone was like, "Yo, if you would have just done that, you would have got the points." That type of thing. But I didn't, I didn't really understand the rules. Um, but I did the best I could. You know, I went after him. I didn't let. Oh, uh, you know, I knew he was like old oh, seven-time world champion, whatever at the time, and I refused to care. And I went out there with that attitude, and I and I thought I did great. You know, it was a good learning experience, and you know, I went to double overtime. And it's not like I was, you know, um, kind of like just trying to hold pace and using wrestling. I was attacking nonstop with submissions against him, and I was close on a couple. And I had a broken hand at the time too, which was mm-hmm. another hindrance. But there was no excuse. He was better than me, and. Uh, it was good. It was a good experience and a good match. And no, it wasn't like in, in the in the nationals. I kind of think I beat myself. You know, I was still still young minded. I still didn't really understand. I wasn't clear minded on the right way to think before fights and before matches. And I, I didn't really understand the mindset you need to have to really be a to to be really be successful. And so I think I beat myself in those nationals tournaments. And uh, I think I was. I I think to be honest with you, I was. I was way better than those guys, and I could have showed that, but I think mentally I, I, I didn't let myself, I beat myself. Yeah, that, that mental yeah. aspect, uh, you know, nobody disagrees. And, and, yeah, yeah. anytime you beat yourself, that's, that's the one that hurts you. you know, hmm. If you go out there and give your best, it's, and I mean, it's not, it's not home to me. We were talking earlier about the Uriah Hall example when you were coming up in the circuit in New Jersey, and, oh, man, be careful about that guy, and you're hearing that again with Anderson. Um, did you Was the Andre Galval match, considering how touted he was in jiu-jitsu at the time when you faced him with so little training, was that maybe your first brush with that, with people saying, you really, you're going you're gonna to face Galval? You know, man, good luck. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the people, the people around me, all, all the people that I was training with, all the black belts I was training with that, they all thought I, would, I could win that tournament, so I believed in them. They they all competed at high levels, and they thought I could go out there and submit everybody. And have, them having that confidence in me is what gave me the confidence that I think I could have, you know, went in there and submitted everybody in that ADCC. But um, yeah, what was the what was the so you weren't you weren't getting any of those signals of man, you know, be careful. That that's a big that's a tall order. Um, no, well, I mean, obviously, um, you know, like people. When you're at the tournament, you know, people see you match yeah. up with Galvan. Like, yeah, people think, oh, you're gonna lose that fight. I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to win that fight. You know, that was my attitude, and so that was good. You know, and I had to, I had to work on getting over that. That, that might have got to me a couple of years before that, where I would have lost that match. You know, um, because of uh, me being myself. And when I, when I stopped wrestling, is when I told myself I'm done, I'm done losing like that, or there's no reason for me to, to fight. You know, I'm not going to be losing to people that, I, that I'm truly better than, you know, and, um, you know, because at that point, it's like, I'm doing this to take care of my family now, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to, that's basically a slap in the face of my family if I'm being myself, so I have to get my head screwed on right, believe in my skills, and, and uh, at least control that aspect of that competition, and it's just, if I'm going to lose, it's because the guy was better than me, and I did everything I can, you know. And you come into the and, fight saying, I'm better than Anderson Silva. Yes. Am I coming to this fight with this fight saying that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I wanted this fight since day one. I just always knew I could beat him. And um, it's the fact that I got to this point, you know, so quick. And I'm just, I'm so excited to go out there and show you guys what, what I plan on doing. It's going to be know, phenomenal. I'm so excited. Uh, yeah. You know, two years after that Galval fight, we're at a crossroads in your career, in your life, that would have totally changed everything. I can't imagine how different, it would be right now, Chris, if you had signed with Bellator Fighting Championships. <laughs> oh yeah. They had a um, they had an offer on the table, and what happened? They had an offer on the table, and, and I'm not bad mouthing them. Like you probably want me to, or people who want no, me no, to. No, 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 not at all. No, because there was an article that came out trying to bad mouth them, and I'm not trying to do that. They they were good guys, they really were, and uh, but um. Um, now they offered me money, man, and again, I had zero money at the time, and they offered me money that probably seemed like no money to a lot of people right now, but to me at the time was, was 
just felt like a whole life-changing amount of money. And if I told you guys a number, you'd laugh because it's pretty much nothing, uh, especially with tax taken out. I can't tell you. I'm not going to tell you the number. I, think, I don't think I'm allowed. But, um, yeah, I just I thought it was everything. So I had my – we had dinner reservations all scheduled and everything like that. And um, there were just things that we didn't agree on, and we ended up – I ended up not saying I'm not doing it, but I was like, I'm going to take some time to think about it. And during that time is when um, Alexis Acaro got in, or had needed uh, an opponent. Right, and you got signed to the U.S. Hang on one, I'm sorry. Sure, on sure, one sure, sure. Okay, you going to take it to um, either Oakland or those? I'm sorry, I know we're on radio. That's okay. I feel like I'm on adventure with you, Chris. It's kind of nice. I know, we are on adventure. Hang on one second. Sure. Okay. I'll drop the table for Stephen Thompson. Room, uh, he's going to just come and pick it up. I just have to leave it here for him. He can tell you if you let me have the desk. Okay. Uh, he's coming in like a little later tonight. Uh, he's, he was, he's already booked in here, but um, I was in the city with him and he needed me to take his bag here. Um, it's room 305, Stephen Thompson. Uh, all right, let's keep talking. No, let's do it. That, that, that'll actually, that, that actually makes a good radio because you're just, it's so funny that you're schlepping around. You're just schlepping around. It's like... Okay. Um, I'm sorry, what? No, I was just saying, this This is actually good. It kind of makes good radio because it, it shows you just kind of schlepping around, just being a normal guy, you know, with this... I know. Yeah, my wife is probably uh, not happy right now. She's just nine. What time is it? Nine thirty at night right now. I yeah. Think she, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Yeah. She. she yeah. yeah. Tell her. Day tell day her I apologize. Day. Like that's gonna make any difference, right? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm screwed either way. So <laughs> let's go down. Let's go down together. Yeah. Okay. That's fine with me. Did um. Did uh, do you think you would have gotten the call to fight Alessio Sakara if you hadn't had almost signed with Bellator? Do you think that helped and made you more intriguing to the UFC? <laughs> Hang on one second, I'm sorry. Please. One more second. All right. I can leave this right here. Uh, I can leave this right here. Um, but uh, Hang on one second. All right. All right, keep going, keep going, I'm sorry. No problem, man. Do you think that you were more appealing to the UFC to fill in to fight Alessio Sakara because you had almost signed with Bellator? Did that up your stock to them at all? No, I, I think they had probably zero clue about that. Because okay. that was a, I don't think that was public information. Okay, all right. So you only you only talked about that afterwards. That that meeting wouldn't have been known outside of the parties to it, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think uh, the UFC knew about that. I mean. Uh, I mean, on MMA fighting, I, actually, it was funny. I mean, who knows? I, I, I never asked Joe Silva about it, but um, on MMA fighting, um, right after Bellator offered me that, I went on MMA fighting, and I said, you know, I've had offers from Bellator, I've had offers from Strike Force, but, you know, I decided to take a step back and take, take a couple of days to think about it. I have a fractured rib, so I'm taking some time. Literally, the next day is when the UFC called me to take the fight. On two and a half weeks' notice, I had the fractured rib. I said it, I said it live on t on the internet. And they asked me, "Are you injured right there?" I said, "No, no, I'm perfectly fine." <laughs> Meanwhile, it's like, I could hardly breathe. So I'm oh. like, "I'm taking this. I don't care." And uh, it ended up ended up paying it off and working out. Did you see Bellator as a way to get to the UFC? Um, yeah. Well, that was you know I wanted. I mean, I, I they had me sold on you know the possibilities of Bellator being you know pretty big time. They they started selling me on it. You know, uh, you know, they were offering me money. I never had money in my life, so it's just like it was so hard. I, I wanted to believe them, you know, and they were doing great things. But UFC definitely was the right place for me. Yeah, and uh, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy I didn't sign with them. Obviously, Let everything me... worked out. I think good for me. Now, of course, we can't expect you to n name numbers. You're you're just not. You can't do it. It's a, you're, you'd be breaking uh, a covenant if you did that anyway. But uh, put it to us this way. Your highest possible payday in Bellator, how much more times that will you make if you beat Anderson Silva? Three times, four times, two times, one and a half times? I have no idea. Hopefully 40 <laughs> times. <laughs> oh, of, oh, right. Of course, with the pay-per-view. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we nail it, knock it out of the park. The pay-per-view and uh, the UFC love my performance, and they want to 
hook me up. Hook you up like that. So you must have been horrified going into the Alessio Sakara fight. I mean, because you knew you beat him by decision. I'm sorry, a healthy Chris Weidman taps Alessio Sakara in the first round. Yeah, I, I, I thought, I thought, I thought I probably could have, but yeah, I, um, I was ter- I was not terrified. I was just like, I gotta keep, I gotta win this fight. I don't care. I'm not making any excuses for myself. It was just another time, like you know, I had, I could have made a million excuses to lose that fight. You know, they gave me a a four-fight deal. If I, they said if I would have lost that fight, they, I mean, they, they told my manager, even if you lose this fight, we understand you're taking a short notice, uh, we'll give you another fight. So in my back of my mind, you know, you could make an excuse for yourself. You know, let me, if I lose this fight, that's fine. I'm Unless you're at the time, he was on a three-fight win streak, a scary mm-hmm. striker. I could I could even freaking drill without being in pain. I couldn't spar or anything. I couldn't get in shape. So I'm just like, crap, you know, I just, I have to find a way to win this fight regardless, and I just refuse to lose and, uh, you know, and, and worry about the rip and just and, and I'll find a way to win. But, yeah, you know, the, it just wasn't the, the way I wanted my UFC debut to be. I wanted to go out there and shine because I, I think I was capable of great things and, and, and really impressing people. So it wasn't like I knew I, it was going to be hard to really impress people the way I was feeling before that fight, you know. So it was kind of a letdown with that. And it was in the first round you tapped Jesse Bongfeld in your next outing in the Octagon at UFC 131 in Vancouver. Got submission of the night for that performance. It was a standing guillotine. You pretty much lifted him and walked forward with his neck and he tapped. Uh, when you do that, w- why don't you jump guard? Is this something where that's your guillotine? Or, or will, might we see you jump guard other times with guillotine? Or you just prefer the standing guillotine? Well, I think it just depends. It depends. If the guy starts defending a certain way, then you could jump to the guard. But... For that one, I need him. Actually, what a lot of people don't realize, I need him in his stomach really hard. Mm. And that's why he grabbed my leg. I knocked the window out of him, definitely. And I knew it was short time. I heard like 10 seconds or whatever. So I, once I grabbed his neck, I knew he was already thinking about it. He can't breathe because of his shot to the gut. So I was, uh, I just tied up his neck, and I was and I was going to squeeze that thing until uh, he, he tapped. You know, I knew it went on fast. He was, so it was pretty much game over. Was there a similar setup in the Tom Lawler fight where you got the Darce choke, or was it just sitting there waiting for you? No, with him, um, it kind of worked out. You know, he just uh, he went to his side a little bit and turned into me, and I just locked it up like a you know kind of longer arms. I could lock it up, kind of cheated in there, kind of cheated to the technique and got it and locked it up, and that was it. No, but it was different. That was more on the ground and took him down pretty fast and just felt the submission and went for it. I've heard and seen breakdowns of you versus Anderson Silva, and I'm sure you've heard and seen breakdowns of you versus Anderson Silva that suggest that the Chael Sonnen blueprint, blueprint rather, excuse me, is, is, is the way to go. You take the guy down, you control him for 25 minutes, and that's your shot to win the fight. But when I see, when I consider your skill set, you know, your wrestling is, is definitely on par to do that or to make an honest run at winning the fight that way. But when I picture you winning the fight, Chris, I picture you catching... Silva in a submission. I picture there being just a little bit of an opening, a little bit of a carelessness that certainly no few others that he's ever faced could take advantage of. I mean, he wasn't on the floor for a moment with Damian Maya. You were. Uh, you know, Sonnen certainly wasn't trying to line up any kind of high-end submissions. All Silva had to worry about was working off his back. Um, tell me this. In, in the different iterations of the fight you run through your head, what percentage of them end via submission? I bet it's 90 yeah, a lot of them, to be honest, with you, because I'll be I'll be extremely surprised if I'm I'm not going in there to take him down and be on top for 25 minutes. If I'm on top for 25 minutes and I don't submit him, I did something wrong, or he or, or I underestimated how good he is on the ground. Because um, I don't care who you are, if I'm on top of you with the ground pound and the and the submissions, I'm I'm finishing it. You know, so I just think. Uh, Eventually, I'm not going to rush anything. I'm not going to be uptight. I'm going to be relaxed. I'm going to be calculated. But eventually, I'm setting something up to, you know, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a submission. Getting, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a hard, strong elbow to cut him. Like, I don't think he's ever even had to worry about that, you know. I'm not I'm not going to waste all these little tiny punches just to, you know, butt him up. I'm, I'm going to look for a position. And when there's time to bring down a sharp elbow on his, on his head, that's what I'm doing. I want to make him, make him, he's going to have to worry about a lot of different things I think he's never really had to worry about before. Why was that insane weight cut for Damian Maya worth it? Uh, it was worth it because, number one, I had to pay my taxes. Hmm. 
it was my first time making money, and I realized, wow, I owe a lot of money in taxes, and I need more money in my bank account. Uh, so that was number one. Number two, I <laughs> I had to um, it, it jumped me into the, you know top ten. It was a he was ranked number five at the time, and it got me right up there. You know, getting to to go against the best guys. And um, yeah, a lot of those big name fighters, they don't want to fight guys who are young, up and coming that don't really have big names. And um, you kind of got to get them on, take them on short notice a lot of times. So. It was a it was a risk. I, I it was a terrible terrible time. It was another thing where it was a time for me to shine. It was disappointing because I didn't have anything. I didn't have I didn't. It wasn't like I wasn't close to a hundred percent out there, and I wasn't able to shine the way I wanted to. Uh, so it was tough in that respect. But I found a way to beat a guy who um, was pretty tough, you know. And, and I, I was on an empty gas tank, empty cardio. And uh, cutting all that weight, so it was, it was good. There's another another one when it was a mental battle, man. I could beat myself in that fight too, you know. Taking this on a couple days' notice, and I gotta cut all this weight, you know. I, sh- I don't, I shouldn't win this fight, you know. I'm, he should beat me, you know, because he's been training, and I haven't, whatever. I could have gave myself reasons to lose, and I refuse to do that again. Yeah, we're wrapping up, Chris. I promise. Uh, did you bring the phone further away from your face or something? What? Okay, that that sounds a little better. I was wondering if you if you pulled the phone away from your face a little bit because it was starting to fade a little bit. Oh, okay. oh I'm sorry. You hear me now? Yeah, yeah, no problem. We're wrapping up anyway. You've been so gracious with your time. Uh, with with that weight cut for Damian Maya, I mean, we've heard about it. We've heard the staggering statistics. Did you feel like you were going to die? I mean, how? What was rock bottom in that weight cut? Yeah, it was terrible. Worst situation ever. And then, you know, I've cut weight my whole life wrestling it. It's always not fun. You just kind of deal with it. You know, no matter what, it sucks. No matter how right you do it, it sucks. But that time was, um, I, yeah, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I was, every time I got out of the sauna, I was fainting. And, you know, I had people carrying me from the towels to back to the sauna and, and back and forth. And uh, the, the, part, the part of that was my coaches were all ready to give, my coaches were all giving up. They were all telling me to stop. Like, you need to stop, you know. And, you know, we're going to call Dana. We're going to call them and tell them. I'm sure they're going to understand, you know. Um, you know, you just took this fight on short notice. You told them, whatever you you know, overweight or whatever. So, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And uh, there was one point when I went to the sauna for 15 minutes, which is an eternity when you're cutting weight and dehydrated. And uh, usually you lose probably a pound and a half, two pounds. I came out of there and I struggled in there for 15 minutes. I literally was like. If I do this 15 minutes, I'll be good. I get out, I step on the scale, and I gain 0.2 of a pound. Ugh. I'm just like, what the heck is going on? And I'm like, faintish, I can hardly talk, I can hardly walk. I was just dead. And then, um, but I just, made, I just made them. I just kept telling them, keep talking, keep doing it. I need to, I need to make the weight. I told them I was going to make the weight. I'm making the weight. You know, I just wanted to be a company guy, and I didn't want any excuses. You know, I didn't want to be the guy who comes in overweight, and then I win, and no, the but they didn't make weight, though. You know, I didn't want anything like that. I wanted to just, I was going to win when parents square, and that's it. So, but so uh, that was that was terrible. So you're just in the sauna in, in a in a in a in a wetsuit or something? Is I mean, how are you cutting that much weight like that? I mean, are you going even further than that? So oh, well, you do. Um, I do like as, as long as you have energy. I do like you know, you put the um, the rubber suit on. Yeah. And the and. Uh, so Apolline, which is the makeup remover stuff, it opens up your pores, helps you sweat a little bit. Mm-hmm. Do that sometimes. And then um, as long as you have energy, you just run and you do like cardio stuff, jump rope, and then you lose like, a lot of weight doing that, to be honest with you. It's like the right way of doing it. And then when you have no energy, then you try to go put yourself in the sauna. You know, not, not with the, I don't do anything with the, uh, the sauna screw on. I just do it when you no shirt, whatever. Yes. Yeah. So, and, uh, so it was just a matter of length. It was just a matter of doing it for just a little bit longer to get to that weight. You didn't have to go a step further. It was just about time. Yep. yep. It's awful. That's awful. I, I yeah. can't, I mean, just like, that. that's not, what does that have to do with fighting? You know what I mean? It's like, that's so, like, the the real struggle, the fight is like a distant afterthought at that point. Yeah, it's funny, man. Like, if you get a nervous for your fight, like, you always just got to remember that, I have to go through the weight cut first. Let's focus on that. <laughs> right. You have a, you, the fight is you're going to feel like an eternity from now because you still have that weight cut ahead of you. You know, so let's, you, have, you focus on that. And then after that, you focus on the fight. <laughs>
For the record, Chris, you cut how many pounds in how many hours for that fight? I cut uh, 32 pounds in 10 days. That's that's disgusting. I can't even. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so so what are you doing good. differently now? I mean, you didn't have any weight issues for the Mark Munoz fight, which was your next and last fight, and, and I suppose you plan on being right in the mark for Anderson. I mean, uh, what do you do differently? Is it just simply that late notice, or did you actually change your diet or try to stay closer to weight throughout camp? No, yeah, my weight is my weight has actually been the lowest it's ever been. I started. I'm actually on a new diet. Um, it's been working awesome, and have a bunch of people behind me with it. But um, I'm like I'm like around 200 pounds, and I use this uh, profile performance diet. It actually was Aaron Simpson's like the head nutritionist with it. He, you know, he retired, and now he's uh, helping with that. And basically, I step on a scale every morning. It does my heart rate, my BMI, everything like that, and then. It, through Wi-Fi, it connects to them, all mm -hmm. the nutritionists out there profile, and Aaron, and, and they can see how much I weigh every morning, and, and they can see through my heart rate if I'm under training, over training. Um, so it's pretty cool um, the way I've been going through that. I mean, to be honest with you, I've been able to eat what I want. Right. I've been cheating a lot. Like last night, I had Shake Shack. My weight is down. My weight is like really down. Like I could eat what I could eat. I could eat whatever you would eat right now, ice cream, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I could eat, and it wouldn't make a difference as far as me making way for this fight. That's, that's how lean I am, and I, I got in really good shape. You know, I'm not, you know, I mean, this is a fight of life for me, so I'm good to go. What uh, what weight do you expect to enter the cage in against Anderson? Probably like 200, 201, 202, something yep. like that. Yep, yep, 201, 202, and like we mentioned, your, your most recent, your last and most recent fight, Mark Munoz, an amazing knockout that really put you over the top as a guy that people thought, we have to see this guy fight Anderson because you just brought this, you know, everyone thought it was going to be a wrestling match and you had the jiu-jitsu edge there and then that's how it would go. But, man, you, you found that elbow at 137 of the second round and put him to sleep after, you know, just a bloodbath. And it was just, it, it, was, it was a phenomenal performance, one that made you seem a cut above. In that elbow that hit Mark Munoz and put you in the position you're in here, what are we seeing? I mean... What does it feel like came to your head for you in that moment to throw that elbow? Um, just to, I'm going to mix it up, you know. It's always about, I think, the, like, you know, the game, the game we play. You know, it's about deception. It's about, you know, chess moves. You know, who's going to make, you know, who's going to make that move where, you know, it costs you. And uh, he kept really throwing that right hand, and I, and I kept making him pay for it. But I, I switched it up every single time. I think one time he threw it. I think twice he threw it, I hit him with a takedown. Other times he threw it, I hit him with a cross. And the other time I hit him with a hook. The other time I threw it with a jab. And then I was like, you know what, let me just, I just let me try something else. He tried to take my head off again with the right hand, and I just, uh, let me try the elbow. <laughs> and it landed, landed nice. So, we come to this point in your career and your life. If you win the UFC middleweight title, Chris, and you come home to New York... What do you think is the first thing you're going to do? Hmm. I'm really probably going to get a sauce egg and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup, <laughs> with a chocolate croissant on the side, oh. big large, pretty too large coffee, iced coffee, and just put my feet up and thank God. Prayer probably be it. <laughs>